William Rodriguez, a janitor at the World Trade Center, talks about what he saw in the basement that day and why he's skeptical of the 9-11 Commission report. Former New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani and former Oklahoma City Mayor Ron Norick discuss how they dealt with the tragedies that happened on their watch. That's tonight on American Perspectives. Tuesday will be the sixth anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. A man who survived the attacks, William Rodriguez, talks about that day, what he experienced, and why he has doubts about the 9-11 Commission's version of it. Mr. Rodriguez spoke in Los Angeles, and this is about two hours. We'd like to begin, but we don't have any sound. Looking for sound. Ah, oh, there we go. Yay. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I can't believe there's so many people here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. My name is Julia Jecker, and I am the producer and the publicist of tonight's event. Good Karma PR was started two years ago in order to promote the works of people trying to affect change. We hope to affect you tonight with our program. First off, let me thank our main sponsors, IDEPSCA, which is the Institute for Popular Education of Southern California. Are you guys here? Can you stand up? <laughs> and KPFK. As of July 17th, 2007, just one month ago today, our current president enacted several executive orders that include language so broad as to encompass anyone who speaks out against their corporate and immoral war. What exactly has happened to our country when simply speaking out or asking questions can be considered an act of dissent? Well, let it be known, we will not be silenced. I would like the people who are listening or maybe watching to hear this. We are professionals, scholars, engineers, scientists, counselors, pilots, ex-military journalists, writers, and many others from all walks of life. This 9-11 Truth Movement can be found in every major city in the United States and around the world. Simply put, we will not ignore the glaring anomalies of that fateful day, no matter how distressing or uncomfortable or unsafe it makes us feel as a nation. We will not stop asking questions about 9-11, and we will not drop the subject. We owe it to the victims and their families and the men and the women who are sick and dying to this very day because of 9-11. As we approach the sixth year anniversary, we the people demand a new and truly investigation, independent investigation into the events of September 11th. I have uh, the great pleasure of working with my partner, Christine Blasdale, who is the senior producer at KPFK Radio, powered by the people. Uh, 
Over the last few years, I've watched Christine desperately trying to make the most of precious airwaves that deliver critical information to the public. In an effort to get these uncomfortable questions concerning 9-11 out to the public, Christine has faced scrutiny and opposition both outside and inside the Los Angeles station. Please let me remind everyone here tonight, for the sake of the victims and the nation, that it is our responsibility as citizens of this country to find out what really happened on September 11th. The truth will not be silenced. Next, please welcome 9-11 Truth activist and supporter, KPFK's own Christine Blasdale. Thank you, Julia. And hello, everyone. I am Christine Blasdale, senior producer at KPFK Radio, heard at 90.7 FM Los Angeles, 98.7 FM to our dear friends in Santa Barbara, and globally at kpfk.org. Before we bring on our next special guest speaker, I'd like to tell you a little bit, if I may, about tonight's media sponsor, which is KPFK, something I know a lot about. For 48 years, this listener-sponsored radio station has not only informed the public, but has built understanding across communities and among individuals, nations, and cultures. KPFK's unique brand of diverse views that's mixed with news, public affairs, arts, health, spirituality, has made it a precious part of Southern Californians' lives. Much like our speakers here tonight, KPFK promotes the creation of a better tomorrow via the full distribution of public information. For only a truly informed public can one day create a truly just world for us all to live in. KPFK stands for speaking truth to power, no matter who it may embarrass. Be it presidents or kings, CEOs or the multinationals that they hide behind, KPFK has had a long history of making them all a bit uncomfortable. And we won't stop now. No matter how many of our emails are read, no matter how many of our phone calls are tapped, no, ma no matter how many times our internet activity is being monitored, no matter how many of our rights have been taken away, we will continue to push the envelope. We must push that envelope. In 1979, when American embassy personnel were being held hostage in Iran, KPFK and Roy of Hollywood were there to make a call into the embassy, and someone actually picked up the phone, making radio history. In 2004, when Haiti's President Aristide and his wife were being kidnapped and taken by force out of office, KPFK and Margaret Prescott went live with a report from the palace to make sure that the truth got out to you people. Unfortunately, if you follow that story all the way through, the U.S.-backed rebel leader Guy Philippe and his paramilitaries retook control of the Haitian army and police. Guy Philippe, by the way, was trained by the U.S. Special Forces in the 90s in Ecuador. And his personal heroes happened to be Chilean dictator uh, Augusto Pinochet and Ronald Reagan. And more recently, after the death of over half a million Iraqi and Afghani citizens, half a million, after Treasury Secretary Paul O'Neill admitted that the Bush administration began planning a war with Iraq long before 9-11, after discovering that prior to 9-11, a large amount of put options were placed on United and American Airlines, after Donald Rumsfeld announced on September 10th that the Pentagon somehow lost track of $2.3 trillion just don't know what happened to it, folks. 
It's magic. After hearing eyewitness testimony saying that people heard explosions going off in the WTC buildings before the planes even hit, and after people like you have demanded more discussion and more debate on that fateful day about September 11th, KPFK was there and is here tonight doing what major media should be doing, giving those who seek the truth a platform to speak. People like William Rodriguez, David Ray Griffin, Professor Stephen Jones. I've been able to bring just a few of these voices to the airwaves, but I need your help. Be it by purchasing their DVDs or their CDs, or by talking to them with other media outlets, not just KPFK. We need to educate others on the dangers of this global war of terror that is being unleashed in the name of those 3,000 plus people who perished on that day at the Trade Towers and at the Pentagon. And I'm here to tell you that one person really can make a difference. Just by starting to, starting to talk to strangers, you can see where you get. More people are waking up, but there's a few that are still asleep. Whatever step you take, whatever small step you take, it will make a difference. For $25 a year, you can become a listener supporter of KPFK, which makes you eligible to vote for the local station board, which helps guide policies and programming. And I can't tell you how important it is to have stand-up, stable people on the LSB. If you want to find out more, you can log on to kpfk.org and get involved locally. Okay, so now I've told you a little bit about the place that I call home. Uh, I'd like to now introduce our special guest speaker. He has consistently, consistently served and committed himself to both human and animal rights, world peace, environmental preservation, and political freedom. And while my partner Julie and I would really like to, we'd like to think that we were the first people that handed him his 9-11 video. We were all secret about it. Mm. Ed, you gotta see this video, it's gonna blow your mind. <laughs> We are eternally grateful to him for his courage to stand up at this time, as well as his courage in speaking out against U.S. policy in Central America, which has for far too many years left millions of people devastated and natural resources devoured. He is perhaps best known as the gruff, gruff but soft-hearted journalist Lou Grant from the TV newsroom comedy The Mary Tyler Moore Show. He continued the role in the newspaper set drama Lou Grant, which won him oodles of Emmys and Golden Globe Awards. He's received several awards for the miniseries Rich Man, Poor Man, Roots as well, bringing his total, if you're counting, to seven Emmy Awards and five Golden Globe Awards. And he was inducted into the TV Academy Hall of Fame and served as national president of the Screen Actors Guild. He was honored in 2002 by the Guild with the prestigious Life Achievement Award, which is given for career and humanitarian accomplishment presented annually to an actor who fosters the highest ideals of the profession. While you may know him best as Lou Grant, I personally can't help but think of him as the voice of God. It was a role he shared with Ellen Burstyn in the audio tape versions of Conversations with God. Probably you haven't heard it, but it's awesome. And I've got to say, Ed, if there, if there really is a God out there, I hope he's a lot like you. <laughs> kind of scary at first, but then when you get to know him, you don't want to leave his side. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome a dear friend at KPFK and a dear friend of mine, Mr. Ed Asner. Thank you, thank you, and good evening to you all. Uh, I think it is typical to say that uh, in any other country, Willie Rodriguez coming to speak, the sanctuary would be jammed to the rafters to hear this 
This man we can call a witness, a witness to truth. And the fact that America does not provide him with the rafter-clinging crowds is symptomatic of what our country is like these days. I came to understand the huge importance, and I don't know where it first originated, what great philosopher coined it, but I, of course, came aware of it during the Vietnam War, with the marvelous bumper sticker, Question Authority. And authority was partially questioned at that time, and it helped change the course of that war, the course of our government, and the people felt, in many respects, a greater strength than they had felt since World War II. There was divisiveness. The one chink in the army was that we didn't respect our troops. So the enemy this time, to those who would deny this war, have come about with nothing but support the troops. If you don't support the troops, then you're a traitor. Well, I think most of us here would be very happy to support the troops by bringing them home. What greater support could we give than maintaining and uh, sustaining human life in our troops? Uh, and so we must fight for that. We must fight for the symbol of the orange. And we must fight for the unbelievable ineffectuality of the American people in attempting to listen to the truth, an unbelievably shy people. I can't tell you the number of people I have been in the company of, scientists, learned gentlemen and ladies, uh, an attempt to open, and I openly say I'm a conspiracy buff, at least as far as 9-11 goes. I believe in it fervently and with all my heart. And I said, if we have time, I will be glad to present the facts as I, as I know them. And those facts have never been refuted. And if they have been refuted, the counter-arguments were never allowed to surface and be heard. And when I present these arguments to people I know and respect, whose intelligences I respect, they get that, that stare on their face. Oh, and sting music starts to play behind, woo, 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 woo. Gotta get out of here. Here's another nutcase. No, no, it's emblematic of how blind our people are to the extent that 50% still believe in, 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 dar in, uh, in creationism. The uh, vast majority, uh, uh, we are so, be so far behind the rest of the Western world in progressive attitudes towards life, the living, towards mankind. And that same blindness affects us on the truth for 9-11. And that's why I am so damn glad to be here tonight, to thank you all for coming to this important event, to rip the scales off your eyes and to hear yet another truth speaker named Willie Rodriguez. <laughs> And the reason we are co we've come together tonight is to pay tribute to this true hero. It's easy to label someone a hero. You know, 
uh, somebody's even had the gall to occasionally refer to me that way, and man, they don't know what the hell they're talking about. A person who rushes into a burning building or even a rescues a cat from a tree is expressing their belief that something other than their own well-being is important and valid and worth saving. And that is a quality that is not only to be admired, but to be emulated. Oh. And how rarely does that emulation take place? But well, what about those people among us who take that extra step? Not only risking their own lives for others at a time of sheer panic and utter devastation, but doing it over and over again and then speaking truth to power, no matter how frightening, no matter where it leads us as a nation. We had a 9-11 Truth Commission that went through like a three-ring circus. I think most of them were hired to rake the elephant. And they did rake the elephant, particularly the GOP elephant. They raked that elephant good to the extent that nobody, even if there was no criminality, there was not even a brownie, i.e. Uh, the New Orleans hurricane, there was no brownie who was dispatched in the tragedy that occurred on 9-11 that a monumental level of incompetence that took this nation and allowed 3,000 people to die and eventually led us to war in two countries, and not one person has been disciplined, censured, fined, imprisoned for lack of competence. Now, On September 11th, the entire planet experienced a tragedy. The world was there to serve us. One of proportions and effects that undoubtedly changed us all in perpetuity. We were told it was 19 Arabs, not 18, not 20, but 19 Arabs with box cutters led by a man in a cave. Let's see, who was that, Methuselah? <laughs> and we all believed what we were told. Besides, what, why would anyone lie about such a thing? As it turned out, of course, if we follow our research, uh, a goodly proportion of those 19 Arabs identified by name alive and living elsewhere. I never found out what the real names of the mistaken Arabs were, but the ones identified as such existed elsewhere, did not die in those crashes. It was also a day that many ordinary people in New York became extraordinary. One such extraordinary, extraordinary man is with us tonight. Under extreme pressure, not only did he put aside the natural reaction of fear, and how many of us know when and where we can do that? Something that can paralyze a person. But he embarked on a journey so massive, so life-changing, that it has expanded and changed the lives of people across the globe. Make no mistake, folks, this is a dangerous man to the Bush administration. His testimony, which was omitted from the 9-11 Commission, destroys the government's official story. And they know it. The corporate media also knows it. Thankfully, we have stations, radio stations like KPFK, 
Let's hear it. And fine organizations like C-SPAN were willing to let his voice be heard. When the simple act of telling the truth becomes a revolutionary act, then we are all in for a bumpy ride. And we should all be there to cushion that bumpy ride for the person who helped show us the route. But if we could strive to be half as brave, half as determined as tonight's speaker, And perhaps we could change the course of history the way he did on September 11th. <sighs> a man of strength, a man of hope, and the last man out of the World Trade Center. Please give a warm welcome to someone who exemplifies the word hero. Mr. William Rodriguez. Kick ass. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Wow, I feel like a coffee cake when they put the syrup on top. <laughs> My goodness, I'm so glad, I'm so honored to be here. I'm so honored to be introduced by one of my heroes. Uh, it doesn't happen every day, really, and I grew up watching you. You're not that old, you're not that old. <laughs> you played Rossi, right? No, actually, I play Ricky Ricardo. <laughs> Do you understand my accent? Do I look like Ricky? Ah, 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 ah. You have some explaining to do. That's what I say to the White House. <laughs> well, number one, welcome. Welcome for being here. Can you hear me in the back? Can you hear me on the top? Thank you. Well, I want to say thank you to KPFK for the effort of putting this together. I want to say thank you to C-SPAN for having the guts to listen to the families of survivors and those affected by 9-11. I'm going to move to the front here. Let me just move a little to the front so we can lower the feedback. And uh, they told me I have to stay within my boundaries. I usually, if you've seen the presentation before, I like to talk to the people, get close to the people, but because we have boundaries, I won't be able to do that. But anyway, uh, my name is William Rodriguez. I am a person that before 9-11, I was a janitor on the towers. I worked in the building for 20 years. 20 years cleaning the stairwells of the North Tower. Now, have you ever cleaned 110 floors of stairwells? <laughs> it's bad! It's really bad, it's not easy. Try doing 25 stairwells, 25 floors. It's really difficult, it's not easy. But that was my job. But incredible was that God really prepares you for things in life. And I'm telling you this because I was agnostic. I didn't believe in God, I didn't believe in anything before 9-11, honestly. I was like, Oh, I'm a spiritualistic. But in reality, was God was preparing me with tools for 20 years. The first 10 years at the World Trade Center, I cleaned the office of the then governor of New York, Mario Cuomo. And I have to be the person with somebody else that set up all the chairs on all the press conferences. And I have to set up the podium, put the water for the governor, and I have to stay there in case of an, any accident or any, anything that had to be cleaned. 
And then also I have to be the person that have to be on the legislation meetings at the office. And I, if you have you seen politics and legislations are really boring, really boring. But I have to be the person there that gave coffee, bagels, and donuts to the legislators. Now, I said that God has a very strange sense of humor. Huh. Because he was giving me the tool that I was going to use after 9-11. Because again, then I learned from the office how to set up a press conference, what a soundbite was, argumentation and debate, everything because I lived through it for 10 years. And after 9-11, when I became an activist, I just used all those tools that were presented divinely by God to me. And that's what I did. So it just goes to prepare you uh, in different levels of life. Now, I'm going to put, uh, put a slideshow. Let me just set it up for you here. And let me just go over here if you give me a second. I just did a... Uh, we can because we are actually uh, filming for the nation right now. So basically, well, I will take you through the slide. I just came from a tour through Europe. This is my fifth tour through Europe. We, I call this one the gravy tour because I was a guy that started attacking me on the internet and attacking the victims and survivors of 9-11 that I sent the attack to everybody and every family member on my list and they send it to other people. And then I started getting invi invitations from all over the world. So we turned a negative into a positive. Now, when we did that, we went all over UK for a month and a half, and we presented basically every single city. I saw more of the British country than the British people. That's Liverpool. I met somebody from Liverpool over here, Grange. Grange was very interesting because the hotel that invited us over there put out a press release after they invited me that said that they were disinviting me. But they never sent that to me. They sent it to the newspaper. And it's a 9-11 hero banned from hotel. And I said, what's going on here? So I called the newspaper and said, oh, it was put out by the hotel. But I didn't do anything. And I went with the presentation. And just to show you how you turn a negative into a positive, it was the biggest audience we ever had because it was packed. So something wrong, you can turn it into something right. So you have to learn that about activism. And that's what happened with Grunge. From there, there was other presentation, radio uh, coverage from BBC on every city, television, uh, meeting with George Galloway, who was a member of parliament, you know, the situation with George Galloway was the one that was brought at the Senate hearing because of the All for Food program, and he basically embarrassed uh, the senator. UK colleges, presentations in Paris. Now, this was in Malaysia last year. I went to Malaysia, and as you know, Malaysia is a Muslim country, Islamic. How many knew that? When I got invited, was to speak at the International Islamic Conference, and I get a phone call. Somebody saying that he was from the State Department. Mr. Rodriguez, don't go to Malaysia. I said, why not? They're going to kill you there. <laughs> Me? Why? Because you are a survivor of 9-11. You represent the victims of 9-11, and they're Muslims. Well, they never told me that Malaysia was, number one, one of the biggest supporters of the United States. Number two, that it was a moderate country. Moderate country. You have Christians, you have Buddhists, you have every single religion over there. So I decided to go anywhere. I went there, and I must tell you, I feel so embarrassed to tell you this. Because when I went to Malaysia, already predisposed by the negativity of going over there, I was treated with more love, more respect, more attention, and more dignity by those Muslim people over there than I did by my own government. I opened it. I opened it. You see, 
It was important to go over there because it was a historical event by itself because here is the last survivor of the North Tower going to a Muslim country to talk about 9-11. The other community most affected because of the event. So they had a vested interest to listen to the families and survivors of 9-11. I met with the Prime Minister, former Prime Minister, Dr. Tumma Hadri Mohammed, the father of Malaysia, nice man, who introduced me to Rafia here, who is the Chancellor to the United Nations, who introduced me to the Chancellor of Foreign Relations. From there, I met the Prime Minister, and so on and on and on. And all we asked was for a new investigation, an international inquiry about what happened on 9-11. <laughs> 92 countries were represented at the towers. And they, that situation makes it an international crime scene. Under the international law, when a country fails to do a thorough investigation, then the other country affected have the right to do their own inquiry. Six years, six years after 9-11, families, victims, and survivors are still searching for answers. We are still searching for answers. We have become the chess game, not only for the federal government, but by the state of New York. Six years after 9-11, we have nothing on ground zero. There's nothing there. Six years after 9-11, we're still asking the government to take the ash and remains of our loved ones that were placed on a garbage dump called Fresh Kills Landing in Staten Island to be removed and be placed back on Ground Zero because we don't want to pray for our loved ones on a garbage dump. Do you think that's okay? No. Do you want to pray to your loved ones on a garbage dump? Yeah. No, because Ground Zero was the lasting place, the last place of our loved ones. That's sacred ground for us, but it has been politicized so much. You know, I used to be the Family Advisory Council for the Lower Manhattan Development Corporation. Check it out. And we knew how much they politicized the whole thing. It was all about the real estate, how to recover the real estate that was lost after the event. All we wanted the families was that on those 16 acres, that we only have three and a half acres left, they placed there a dignified, respectful memorial so we can go and show respect to our loved ones. They said, we're going to have it, we're going to have it. You know that the design has been changed continuously. The World Trade Center was built with no oversight by the federal state or the city because the World Trade Center was owned by the Port Authority, an autonomous organization that did not have to abide by these rules and regulations. But they say that they surpass those codifications. Six years after 9-11, we're still dying, dying. Why? When the collapse of the tower happened, the biggest toxic environment was released. That's right. Release. You have 160 almost first responders that went there to clean up the area to look for the remains of our lost ones. They were exposed to the highest levels of carcinogens, PCBs, 116 different toxins. 160 of them from 10,000 that went there are dead. All the rescue dogs, dead. 62,000 people in New York sick, and they don't recognize it for the simple reason that it would be the biggest liability case against the state. It was dollars and cents. Now we have people that don't have $100 a week to pay for their medicine, and they're still dying now. They have a death penalty. They have a death sentence on top of them. And it's immoral that six years after, we have not taken care of them. Just look at the pictures of the Pentagon and the pictures of the World Trade Center cleanup. On the Pentagon, you have everybody on hazmat 
protective gear from head to toe. Then look at the World Trade Center. They have those masks, paper masks. They're not even good to speed on. And t-shirts. That's what you have. The EPA knew it was the highest levels of contamination ever recorded in, recorded in history. But they wanted Wall Street to be reopened. We have the internal memo that basically talks about that. I did an interview with Dr. Doc Rocky, the father of the depleted uranium program for the military. And on video, he said that his unit is the first one that has to be called in, the, in a disaster, a national disaster, environmental disaster. And he called the EPA, and he was told to be quiet and to go away. And we have that on video. And this is the foremost expert. So six years after 9-11, we're still suffering. The nation is still suffering. We are an open wound that has not closed. We are, we are in a process of healing that never comes. The families are still dealing with that process. The people affected are still dealing with that process as well. But the world has been affected directly because 9-11 has been the catalytic event that changed the history of the world in the new millennium. Anywhere I've been in the world, anywhere, they know about 9-11. Actually, they know more about 9-11 than we do over here. Yeah. They're very concerned. 9-11 has been used as an excuse to basically eliminate civil rights everywhere. In the United States right now, you can be stopped and held against your will without the right to a lawyer indefinitely and without a court order. The spying program, remember the domestic spying program that they lied about it? Some whistleblower came out and said, oh, they're spying on the people here. Was a hearing, oh, no, it's only 6,000 people. And then we find out it was... Three million people? What about, now they have the wait, I mean, they have the order that they can open your emails, your mail, they can tap your phone with our court order. I mean, constant loss of our rights because of our tragedy. We do not agree to this international political agenda. We don't. On Malaysia, I spoke some of the meetings. That's the king of Malaysia. I met the king. I met the king. <laughs> Four press conferences. I will appear on every television uh, news item. I will open the news at 8 o'clock every night. And they said at the end of the presentation, of, of the, the week that I spent there, that the Malay mindset about what happened on 9-11 and the issue of the victims will never be the same. It changed their mind forever because they didn't know about the victims' issues because the information usually stays only in New York. Some people here don't even know what's going on over there with the victims. So from there, I went to Venezuela. Yeah. And you know how Hugo Chavez loves the president. You make with the devil! You make with the devil! <laughs> you see, I went to Venezuela because after 9-11, there were so many errors and mistakes because we were not prepared of an event of this magnitude. So we created something called the Blueprint to Avoid Future Emergency Disaster Management. We wanted the world that showed so much compassion for us, the victims, to have this study so they will not commit the same mistake. Things like who has to be the first responder, how you set up a family assistance center, what kind of technology you have to use in an emergency, how you distribute the funds. You remember the issue with the funds. $1.7 billion were collected for the victims. A non-for-profit organization were charging 70 cents per dollar on administration costs. Immoral? Yes. You know the scandal that happened with a red organization out there that 
the president quit because she wanted to create something called an um, uh, liberty fund for the victims, and the board wanted to have a general fund so organizations all over the nation, not related to 9-11, will go there and dip in and use it for computers, for pencils, for whatever. That was happening. I was a member of the board of directors of the 9-11 United Services Group, which was a coalition of non-for-profit organization that was created to help the victims. So I have an internal view of what was going on and the problems. So we wanted to give this to other countries so they would not have the same problem. But, but of course, while I was in Venezuela, and I speak Spanish very well, say hello to my little friend. <laughs> I was in Venezuela talking about this, but at the same time talking about my experience on 9-11 and the issues with the commission. And something strange happened. I get called by the director of the hotel where I was staying. Mr. Rodriguez, come to the front. Okay, I went to the front. He said, yeah, can I help you? Mr. Rodriguez, the reason that we have called you here is because something very strange happened. I said, what? Somebody came here and requested the list of all the guests staying in the hotel. And what does that have to do with me? And he said, because the person that came here identified himself as an FBI agent. He showed a badge. I said, what did you do? He said, oh, we kicked him out because they have no jurisdiction. <laughs> But you see, I got scared because I said, what is, why they, I mean, what's going on? If they wanted something, they could have called me. I mean, I, what's the problem? But I got scared. And I said, what does that have to do with me again? And he said, you're the only guest staying in the hotel. This is in the middle of the beach, all right? I'm the only one with a suit. Everybody was in shorts and sandals going to the beach. He said, you're the only one doing interviews on television, radio, and newspaper. So we know it's related to you. So I got scared, and I did what I thought it was right at that moment. I went on the following interview within an hour or so after, and I said the whole story with the hotel. Then I get a phone call at the hotel, very strange, a phone call from the palace. I'm getting a call from the palace. It's like getting a call from the White House. So, Mr. Rodriguez, we, we would like to invite you to the palace. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, now I'm scared, let me go. And I said yes, and I went to the palace in Caracas. And I went to the palace and uh, I was given this beautiful tour. And incredibly that the person that received me was Dr. Nicolás Maduro. He was at that time the president of the National Assembly. He's the most powerful man in Venezuela after Hugo Chavez. He's now the Chancellor of Foreign Relations for Venezuela. He's the one that was stopped at the airport here at the United Nations last year. And he said, Mr. Rodriguez, come into my office. And I was like, uh oh, OK. And he goes, tells me, sit down. And you know when they tell you to sit down in a government office on another country, you're looking for the cameras. I was like, oh my god, what's going on here? And he said, Mr. Rodriguez, the reason that we have called you here is number one, we believe you. We know you're telling the truth. Number two, we check you out because we have our own intelligence. Number three, we know that that person that you talked about, the FBI agent, we identify him because we know who comes into our country and who leaves our country. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm getting nervous now. I say, oh my God, what's going on? He said, Mr. Rodriguez, we're going to do something for you. I said, what would you do? And he said, we are going to give you protection. <laughs> now, I got very scared. He said, protection, why? He said, because we believe, we believe that your own country will do a hit on you on Venezuelan soil, blame it on us, and come over here and do whatever they want. And I got scared. And they gave me five bodyguards while I was in Venezuela, five bodyguards to protect me. 
This is scary, it's very scary. But the thing is that while I was there, and we're putting a video together of all those experiences, it was something like the movies, like, you know, a comedy movie. Because if I have to go to the bathroom, two guys will stand at the door, two guys will go in, get everybody out, everybody go. <laughs> so I could go to the bathroom. That, that, it, was, it was crazy. Scary, scary, scary. But you see, he gave me a crash course on something that I never understood, which was false flag terrorism. When a country does, do something against somebody, blame it into somebody else so they can do whatever they want. And I was like, whoa, 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 what am I doing? What am I getting into? From there, I went to Chile. Chile have 9-11 also, because 9-11 symbolizes nationally the day that Pinochet took over from Salvador Allende. So they thought that something was going to happen to me over there as well, and they gave me two generals to go with me everywhere. So I'm like, what the hell? I'm just a janitor. <laughs> I was like, my goodness. So also we put in the video together with that. So we have so much from the last six years that we are trying to bring to the, to the world. So as you know, and I, let me show you this part, that I started uh, coming out with benefits and legislations for the victims because there was a situation that the politicians were not getting close to the victims because they didn't want to be accused of using 9-11 for political purposes. So they left us, left us alone. So we started working on those things. They passed. This is when we did the scholarship program for victims of terrorism. It passed. It gave education, free education up to the age of 31 to any of the orphans of 9-11. $35 million were allotted uh, by the legislature and Governor Pataki. Then we did one in Spanish. In other words, not in Spanish, but for the Latino community, because as you know, from a $1.7 $1 billion that were collected for the victims, less than 2% went to the Latino immigrants that were affected by the event in the towers. So it was like a total disproportion. And uh, from there, when we saw that the victims of the windows of the world, which was the restaurant that was located on the top of the building, mostly immigrants, the families were not getting any help because the program, the federal compensation program, and all that stuff, FEMA is federal, it's only for citizens, they were not taking care of these victims that were basically killed like everybody else. So I went to every non-for-profit immigrant group and I asked them for help. And you know what? They closed the door on me. What? They said, don't lose your time. You're never going to get it. I've been fighting for this for so long. Uh, nothing. There was a federal compensation program created. The president designated Mr. Kenneth Feinberg as the administrator of this program, and I will show up on every press conference that he made, and every time he said, well, any question, I was like, huh? what about the immigrants? What about the people without papers that died in the, in the building? Oh, you cannot help them. You cannot recognize them. They're non-existent. Can you identify them? That's the problem. Every press conference. So he got angry at me at the last one. He said, uh, you, Mr. Rodriguez, if you identify those people, I will help you. I said, ah! Oh! And I went to Telemundo, and I went to Univision, and I said, I need a television commercial. And I did a television commercial, I identified all the people, went to Congress, spoke to him, and said, you have to deliver now. And within 90 days, we have the amnesty to help these people. But then I learned something. They told me that this non, I mean, this group that supposedly helped the immigrants were not going to help me anyway because that's their business. Think about it. You go to an office, oh, I need help. They charge you for the papers. They charge you for the process. So if they get an amnesty, the whole system of their business will fall apart. So you have to be careful who you work for. So all these things is happening 
after 9-11. I became an activist without knowing that I was doing it because there was so much trouble. Then you have the situation with the IRS. You know, the IRS was shaking off victims. People were coming over and saying, you know, the IRS called me and said that I have to pay the taxes of my husband that just died. He was the earner of the household. How am I going to pay this money? And a call to the IRS said, number one, that it was none of my business. And number two, that did I ever heard that the only sure thing in life was death and taxes? <laughs> so we press, we press, we work. Uh, we call Hillary Clinton, Senator Clinton. We call other people, and we have something called the Tax Relief Act for victims of terrorism, which actually erased the taxes of any victim after 9-11, any act of terrorism. For two years, they don't have to pay taxes. And it was also passed in record time. So, <laughs> now, I become the image of 9-11 for the Latino community. I appear on programs that you may not even know, but they're more powerful than Oprah. Oprah gets 35 million viewers a day, but I was appearing on Cristina. <laughs> Cristina is 102 million people at a show. I was appearing in Primer Impacto, Aquí Ahora, Al Rojo Vivo, programs that have more viewership because they go into so many Latin countries. And I became the image for the community on everything related to 9-11. So, of course, by default, I was asking questions. Because they took me from there. Let me show you. Oh, they call this photo opportunity. I call it photo abuse. <laughs> this is the investigation request that we did with the then Attorney General of New York, Elliot Spitzer. He said it should have been done on a federal level. Media expert on 9-11 for several newspapers, in English and in Spanish. Don't shoot me! Don't shoot me! Don't shoot me! Don't shoot me! But now, now comes to the part that I want you to understand. What I just did now is the part that I hate the most. Because I'm talking about, I did this, I did that, I, 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 I. You know why? I'm going to tell you why. When they saw that I was doing all of this, they said, this is the guy that we need to run for political office because he can get the Latino-Hispanic vote. We're talking about 30 million voters nationwide. The community loves him. He's a hero, he saved hundreds of people, and at the same time, have no training and making changes in the community, we want him to run. So they told me to go and get training. And I said, okay, I just lost my job. <laughs> and I took the training. And the first thing that you learn is what I'm doing right now, which I hate, but I wanted to take you by the hand so you will understand why am I doing this. The first thing that they teach you is that, as a politician, you have to tell the community what you have done so you will understand what I represent on that community. And that's the first thing that I learned. When you see a politician on television, you say, oh, I work on legislation 1507, that will, you always see the same thing. This is all political training. Did I run? Absolutely not. Did I want it to run? Maybe. Maybe, because I thought I could have done more for the community at that time. Sadly, that's when we started asking questions about 9-11. We wanted to have a formal investigation about what happened on the event. As you may remember, the administration did not want a formal inquiry about what happened on that day. They did not want it. They called the victims to give support to the president. They didn't want this. Think about this. They said, we don't need an investigation. We know who did it. It was the Muslims. Now, ladies and gentlemen, anywhere in the world, if you lose a loved one in a catastrophe like that, do not allow any government, any institution to tell you, you don't have the right to an inquiry. Always execute that right. Always do that. They didn't want it. We press, we put every family member that we could on every television show, 
And guess what? They got fed up with us. We said, okay, okay, we're going to do it. Because it was so much publicity. So, said, okay, we're going to do it. But we want somebody to represent the administration on that commission. And we said, okay, no problem. Who would that be? And they said, Henry Kissinger. <laughs> oh! For those who don't know, Henry Kissinger is considered a war criminal in many countries. And this was sending the wrong message to the nation and to the world that showed so much compassion for the victims. So we didn't want that. And they said, it's not for the family to decide. You have no option in here. That's what we want. Somebody, a pro bono lawyer, gave us the information, checked his client list. No, number one, have you ever heard Henry Kissinger speak? Now, if you have a problem understanding my accent, <laughs> try understanding Mr. Kissinger. <laughs> and I hate to make fun of people, but in reality, I could not understand the man. <laughs> family members have a meeting with him, and uh, the family group is just trying to get his client list and uh, other issues, and he didn't want to give us anything. And the reason we wanted that was because we knew he had clients from Iraq, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, all those countries that were claimed by the administration to be sponsors of terrorism. And that made it a conflict of interest. When the families decided that they were going to have a press conference, Mr. Kissinger had a preempting press conference which was, I am removing myself from the 9-11 Commission because I'm too busy. Yeah. Tell that to the families. Tell that to the families. Families have been vilified. The Jersey girls have been called witches and money-hungry women because they have been pressing for information, truth, the papers that were collected by the 9-11 Commission, all of that and they are vilified by the far right because they don't want this information to come out. They don't want it. So, of course, here we are. We press, we get the 9-11 Commission approved, but at that time, remember that the president, how many people remember that Bush, President Bush, I'm sorry, <laughs> wanted to have a connection between Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden. Yeah. You remember that? Yeah. He wanted to say that they were connected on 9-11, that they did 9-11 together. It was Hans Blitz, the inspector of weapons of mass destruction there, that came out and said, no, there's no connection. Re remember Mr. Richard Clark, who was the czar of intelligence for the administration, who came out and said, mm -mm, they wanted me to make the connection, and I know there's no connection. And on the 9-11 Commission hearings, he said they lied to the families. Well, actually, they failed the families on 9-11. So here you have that they're using our disaster, our despair, to do an invasion on Iraq. So we work and we organize a march against the war. And I was highly criticized because I started the march with soldiers. How dare you, Mr. Rodriguez, using our finest people to start a march against the war with soldiers? How dare you? Actually, we expected 10,000 people, and we have the biggest march ever in history. We have 225,000 people marching against the war. So, of course, what you have here is that I get embarrassed. I have a sachet that says, stop the war, stop the invasion. I get embarrassed because I have soldiers. And I said, okay, I'm sorry. I am so sorry. I'm not going to do it again. I, I promise you, I'm not going to do it again. But I must tell you that next week I'm doing another march, but I will not use soldiers. And I did organize another march, and guess what? We got attacked again because this time I used officers. <laughs> Whom 
make them happy. You cannot make them happy. But when you're morally right, you've got to continue doing what is morally right. Well, the 9-11 Commission gets created after so much pressure. As you know, I'm one of the instrumental uh, people to get it uh, organized. But one caveat that we wanted to have a family member to represent the victims on the 9-11 Commission. They said, no, it will not be allowed. They didn't want it. As a matter of fact, it was never accepted that a family member will be part of the Commission. All right? On top of that, the organization is created with one caveat that FEMA, uh, the FBI, the CIA, the Department of State, Department of Justice will be exempt of prosecution. And when you have something exempt of prosecution, what do you need an investigation for? We wanted them to have subpoena power. They didn't want it. They got it. They never used it. Think about that. Now, this is going to make you very angry. Ladies and gentlemen, they spent more money on the Monica Lewinsky trial than the death of 3,000 and change. It was more important for America to find out what Monica was doing under the desk than the death of 3,000 people. How immoral. How immoral. So now, here we are. I testify for the 9-11 Commission behind closed doors. I was not the only one, because there's rumors that I was the only one. No, I was not the only one. There were other people that testified behind closed doors. But I was, remember, the minion, the person that was going to run for office, their hero. And my testimony when they came out with the final report, 576 pages, doesn't appear anywhere. No. I made 27 people available from my uh, experience. They were never called. 15 uh, firefighters were never called. 650 employees of my company that were in the building were never called. Now, when you do an investigation, you have to do every inquiry possible, anywhere. Do you agree? Yeah. Do you agree? Whether it's an allegation, whether it's true, whether it's wrong, you have to check everything. Now, on 9-11, I called my office. It was a beautiful day. It was a beautiful Tuesday. And I called my supervisor, his name, Anthony Saltalamachia. And I say, Anthony, I'm not going to work. And he went crazy. No, you got to make it to work. What's wrong with you? Come. Because nobody wanted to do my job. Again, remember, it's 110 flights of stairwells. So if I, took from, if I took off from work, that meant that somebody had to do my job. Rodriguez routine, no, I'm going home too. And people would leave because they didn't want to do it. So, of course, he begged me to go to work. And I said, okay, I'm going to be late. I made it at 8.30 in the morning, 8.30. And I went straight to the uh, basement number one of the tower. The building has six sub-levels of basement, B1, B2, all the way down to B6. Our support office for American Building Maintenance, that was the company that I worked for, was located on B1. So I went there, I'm talking to the supervisor, in front of the door, when all of a sudden, at 8.46, talking to him, there's 14 people in the office, we hear, boom! An explosion so powerful and so loud that pushed us upwards in the air coming from below. And it was so powerful that all the walls cracked, the fall ceiling fell on top of us, the sprinkler system got activated, and everybody started screaming in horror, help, 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 because we didn't know what was going on. Everybody screaming. The first thing that comes to my mind is that a generator just blew out on the mechanical room. The mechanical room was located right below us on the B2 basement number two. And that's where you have all the generators, all the water pumps, all the machinery for the elevators. Everything was there. But I'm speculating. I'm speculating. I'm saying it's a generator to myself. Not that it ever was a generator because I never know what it was. I never find out what it was. But when I went to verbalize it, because everybody's screaming in horror, we hear, bah, and an explosion all the way on the top of the building. And that was the plane hitting the top. Two different events, separated by almost seven seconds. Different events. 
And when we hear that, remember the building was designed to oscillate. And it shakes from side to side so much that you could hear the walls cracking. And everybody's screaming in horror, help, help! But nobody's moving. Everybody's like paralyzed. And all of a sudden, from the corridor, this person comes running in, hands extended, saying, explosion, explosion, explosion. His eyes in horror, and his hands extended. And when I looked at him, he had something hanging from the top of the fingertips that looked like clothing. And when I see that, and he get closer, ladies and gentlemen, I realized it was his skin was pulled from under his armpits on both arms, and it was peeled off, and it was hanging from the top of the fingertips. It was a black guy named Felipe David, a Honduran from a, a company called Aramark, who I did not know. I never met that guy before. And his skin is hanging. As he gets closer, everybody's screaming in horror. As he gets closer like this, all this part of his face is hanging. It's hanging. And when we see that, again, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And his red shirt, because it wasn't red, it was soaked in blood. I said, don't move, please don't move. I went inside the office to pick up the phone to call the emergency medical unit that was located on the South Tower. You see, the North Tower and the South Tower connected through the basement. And they were very fast to respond. When I went to pick up the phone, pa! another explosion. The building shakes so much, and the floor started moving below us that people thought that it was an earthquake. And they started going inside the office under the door frames thinking that it was an earthquake. And they're piling up over there, screaming, help, help, help. My supervisor, Anthony Saltalamacchia, is screaming, it's a bomb, it's a bomb. Not that it was a bomb, but he survived, like I did, the bomb of 1993. On 1993, a bomb was placed on that tower on February 27, and it killed six people, injured 1,000 people, and he's acting by osmosis. He's reacting to an experience. But nobody's helping Mr. Felipe David because he's there, he's unextended. So I took a towel and I put it around him. You see, this was 2001, when you have the eighth scare, nobody will touch anybody with blood. Nobody. And the guy is like, you know, there in shock. Put the towel around, put it on my shoulder with the help of the other guy. There was another guy there. And uh, we start screaming, let's get out of here. Follow me, follow me. Follow me, let's get out. And I start leading the way from the office to the loading dock, from the loading dock down, then up to a hill outside the building. When I get outside the building, there's an ambulance coming. I stop the ambulance, put Mr. Felipe David inside. He goes into a coma. And you know when a person goes into a coma, they start putting adrenaline, they go crazy trying to revive him. And this is going at the same time I hear, a plane hit the building, a plane hit the building. There was a security guard standing in front of the loading dock entrance. This was the guy that let trucks go in. And he's saying the plane hit the building. But when I look at him, he's not talking. It's his radio. The radio is doing a transmission saying that the plane hit the building. When I look at him, he's looking up, and everybody is looking up. So I turn around, and when I look up, what do I see? I see the hole, I saw the fire, I saw the brick coming down but the smoke was so dense that it covered the top of the building. The building, the North Tower, the one that was hit first, was the one with the antenna. Now, I could not see the antenna. And as I look up, but remember, it was an illusion, because when you're at the base of a tall building, and you look up, you really cannot see the top. So when I look up and I cannot see the top, I start screaming, oh my God, oh my God, the people from Windows, the people from Windows. And I meant the people from Windows of the World, that restaurant that was located on the 106th floor. And you see, it was a miracle that I'm out there saying that. Miracle. Why? Because if I was there on time, at 8 o'clock, I would always go and do my cleaning routine from the top of the stairwells all the way on the top of the building, down. And I was there every morning at 8 o'clock, because they gave me breakfast for free. <laughs> and when they give you something for free, you're going to be there on time. <laughs> Am I right? right? So I'm there. 
screaming, we got to go back, we got to go back. And nobody wanted to go back. My supervisor saying, Willie, you stay here, you're not going back in. And I said, you know what, forget you. <laughs> okay, it wasn't forget you. But I said, forget you. And I went to the security guard, I took the radio, and I started running back inside the building, threw the loading dock down, straight to the South Tower. And the reason that I went to the South Tower was because after the bomb of 1993, the Port Authority spent $155 million retrofitting security, uh, 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 making the building stronger because of what happened on 93, you know, reinforcing the walls. And they set up something called the OCC, which was called the Operation Control Center, which was a center that controlled everything that was emergency. And I went there to let them know that there was a person injured outside the building. So I go there with the radio, and that was supposed to be manned 24 hours a day. And I start hitting the window, help, help, help. There was nobody there. There were people there earlier because there were transcripts of people being there earlier. But where were they when I was hitting the window? So I'm screaming, a person comes from below named Jimmy Barrett. Jimmy Barrett comes up and says, Willie, what's going on? He was on the basement of the South Tower, and he never heard anything. And that gives you an indication how many people probably died without ever knowing what was going on. And I say, you got to get out. This just happened. An explosion. A, a, a person with a ski hanging went through the whole process. And when I looked to the side, between the South Tower and the North Tower, there was an employee entrance for the Marriott Hotel. There was a hotel called the Marriott Hotel. There was a podium there, like this one, and there was a Hispanic, Hispanic Latino lady there trembling. She was the one that signed people in. And I went over there and said, what are you doing here? Get out, get out now. And she said, I heard everything, but I cannot leave because I'm a new employee and I don't want to get fired. <laughs> the ignorance, because we didn't know what was going on. And remember, we're not getting the transmission. You have over a thousand people using two frequencies just at the World Trade Center. On top of that, those heroes, my heroes, the firemen, their radio failed. Their radios failed. They were not getting transmission as they were supposed to. You know, you here were getting better information about what was going on inside the building than we did being inside the building. On top of that, and remember, right now, and this is an aside, you have Mayor, ex-Mayor Giuliani running for President of the United States on their 9-11 ticket. Yeah. Well, the families and victims, most of them feel the same. As a matter of fact, I must tell you that a couple of weeks ago, the Firemen's Union exposed Giuliani for using 9-11 for running for political office and blame him for being part of all the mistakes that happened on that day. We blame him for many of the issues, especially when he, caught in the budget, gave the heroes lower quality radios to save money. Now, what you have here is a constant manipulation of our event to do this. Now, on top of that, you have to realize that when 9-11 was going on that day internally, that lady didn't know. I pushed that lady out. Get out, get out, get out. Pushed it out. Out of the building with Jimmy Barrett. We went back to the North Tower. And the reason we went back to the North Tower, all the water is there. The sprinkler system, remember. And when I get there, I only found one person, a guy that worked for the recycling company. And he said, I hear screams, I hear screams. But we couldn't hear anything because of the shh, shh, the water sound. The World Trade Center had more than 150 elevators. So I put my ear in one of the elevators, was called the K6 car. And when I put my ear, what do I hear? Two people screaming, help, help, help. And something that I never forget and shocked me. Say, we're going to drown. 
And I couldn't understand why they were saying that. There were two people there that apparently, later I find out when the explosion happened in the basement, they went to cover themselves on this elevator. The door closed because it was a freight elevator. The door closed this way. And instead of going up, they went down. They lost power. They got encapsulated between two levels, between the B2 and the B3 floor. And they're encapsulated. And all the water from the sprinkler system was going in, but wasn't coming out at the same rate. And they're screaming that they're going to drown. Now, remember what I told you. I was agnostic. And at that moment, I said, God, please help me. Help me. With such a devotion, with such a soul, my entirety, my, 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 my soul was praying for these people. Please help me. And when I look down, what do I find? In an area that was supposed to be totally clean of debris, construction debris, I found a metal pipe. Took the metal pipe and with the help of the other guy, we opened the door. The door opened up this way. Once the door at the bottom hits my level of the feet, all the water that is on my side goes rushing in. That's when there's no elevator there. I look down. When I look down, I see these two people. Help! Help! And you're going to ask me, how was I able to see them? Because it was a freight elevator. And freight elevators don't have a ceiling, a roof, like a regular elevator. It's just a metal mesh, and you can see through. And when I look down, there's two guys with water up to here. One of them, Salvatore Giambanco, a painter for the Port Authority who I did not know. I never met this guy before, and a delivery guy. And again, we don't know how to help him. And again, I said, God, please help me. And like a flash came to my mind that in the area where you have the trash compactors for the towers, the electricians always had ladders that they used for changing light bulbs, changing cables, but they always tied them up to a pole with chains and a lock so nobody would steal them because it was at the loading dock entrance. You could go with a delivery truck and say, oh, nice ladder, and steal it. I still have one. <laughs> so I'm running over there saying, God, please let me find one. Let me find one. And I ran there, and they were all tied up and chained and locked, except one of them. The longest one of all of them was there to save these people. And I picked that up, and I went back. We dropped it inside. We went inside. And you know those stories of... Uh, People in difficult situations have an adrenaline rush and they have strength that they don't know where it comes from. <laughs> because we were able to pull these two guys with basically one hand out of the elevator. Wow. We got them outside, put them in an ambulance, and I start running again down the loading dock inside the building while everybody's going don't go back, don't go back, don't go back. And I started talking in Spanish because I didn't want to be stopped. No, no, yo tengo que volver para atrás porque no quiero que me paren porque tengo, mis amigos están ahí. And they, what did he say? Because I didn't want to be stopped. I wanted to get to my friends. And when I get down there, I only found one person. Police officer David Lim, in charge of the K-9 unit. Those dogs that smell for bombs and, and explosives and, uh, and, and, I'm sorry, bombs and, and drugs. He was the one in charge of that. And he said, Willie, do you have the key? Do you have the key? And he meant, did I have the master key? There were five master keys in the building on that day. The people with the other four were trained on egress, escape, rescue, first aid, everything. And I have the other key. And the reason that I had that key was because in 1996, while I was mopping the floors, I slipped on the stairwell. And this is the stairwells. I slipped a whole set of stairwell, hurt my back, and the company never sent anybody to look for me. So I sued the company and I sued the Port Authority on an arbitration labor case, and I won the master key. And this is the master key. <laughs> This is the master key. And we call this the key of hope because thanks to this key, hundreds of people 
were safe on that day. And the reason is this key was so important was because the World Trade Center was a class A building and under the building codification of the state of New York, any skyscraper will need to have an encasement system in case of a fire. As you can see here, that means that three doors on the World Trade Center on the escape routes, three doors will not open, will not open, then one will open. Then three doors again will not open on the stairwells. Then one will open consecutively all the way to the 110th floor. And that's why this key was important because in 1996, that's why you have a thousand injuries because they spent so much time breaking those steel doors to pry them open. So I said, yes, I have the key, let's go. And we made it to the lobby. When we made it to the lobby, the firemen are there with something called a fire access key, which is a key that they will put on any elevator. And if the elevator is up, we'll come down. If it's down, we'll come up to save the time. I mean, to save time. And they will go and take it. So I said, yes, yes, yeah, let's go, let's go. And the police officer is saying, don't wait for the elevator. Follow him. He knows the best way to go up. And he has a master key. So we started going up the stairwell. And those heroes again, my heroes, I can't stop saying it. It was a memory that I could never forget for the simple reason that as we go up, they have the most difficult time going up the stairwells because they have between 55 to 125 pounds of equipment in their backs. Have you seen something called the Jaws of Life, which is a machine that if you have a car accident will break the... the they have that, they have drills, they have a guy called the tank oxygen man. We have two tanks and change the tanks for all, uh, somebody else. But as we went up the stairwell, people coming down were bumping onto us constantly, which made our process of going up very difficult, extremely difficult. As we go up, people coming down, bumping onto us, we said on the third floor, let's change. So let's go by the A staircase. The World Trade Center has three stairwells, A, B, and C. So we went by the A stairway, which was the one that faced the area that was hit by the plane. As we go up, I started opening doors and letting people out. Opening doors, letting people out. Those, that key opened all those doors. Those heroes will go in because firemen go as a unit. They go in as a unit. They go in and they spread. And they look for the officers to bring people out, and they just reunite and get out. That's how they do it. So opening doors and letting people out. But then I found myself sometimes two and three floors above the firemen opening doors. I say, what's going on? These people are not the same rate as I'm going up. What I didn't understand at that moment was that, number one, I did not have any equipment in my back. I did not have any protective gear. I didn't have the helmet, the, the fireproof vest, uh, the boots. And on top of that, I did the stairwells every single day. For 10 years, I was doing that stairwell. I was in better physical condition than the firemen. Well, at least at that time, because I think I have to do the stairwells again. <laughs> so I'm going up, and I said, like, what's going on? And again, you know, those heroes are not going at the same rate, because they are trying to go into every office. And as I go up, I hear, pa, 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 three huge explosions. And I was like, what was that? And I got so scared that I went down and I went to the fireman and I said, what was that? What was that? And he said, it must be the gas tanks blowing up in the kitchens. It must be the gas tanks blowing up in the kitchens. The kitchens, ladies and gentlemen, were all electrical. That did not make sense. The World Trade Center was a class A building. That's, anybody in construction here will tell you that that's hazmat. Hazardous material is not allowed. So, of course, I wasn't going to have an argument with that guy at that moment. Yeah, okay, gas tanks, all right. Yeah, okay. 
So I went up and I continued, but it was so huge that it stayed in the back of my mind. So I continued opening doors and letting people out up to the moment that somebody, two guys came down on the stairwell and one of them said, there's a man on a wheelchair on the 27th floor and he's having problem breathing. He cannot breathe. And I said, what can I do? I don't know what to do. So I went back down and I told the firemen and they said to me, don't worry, we're going to make it there. But he's going to be the last person that we take out. And I got angry because I found that to be very insensitive. I said, this is a man on a wheelchair. He cannot walk. And this guy is telling me that he's going to be the last, the, the last one being taken out. What I didn't understand, and I want you to understand this, that in a matter of an emergency, handicapped people is always left for the last. Because imagine you coming down with a wheelchair on this stairwell, the queue of people trying to escape, able bodies, will be trapped behind the wheelchair. But I didn't understand that. That was explained to me by one of the fire chiefs after 9-11. I was angry at that moment. I said, all right. But we continue going up until the moment that I get to the 27th floor. When I get to the 27th floor, I open the door. When I open the door, these heroes went in, and each one, one by one by one, collapsed on the floor because they have no more stamina left. They went 27 floors up with all that equipment in their back. They have no strength left. And as they collapse on the floor, I say, oh my God, oh my God. And the police officer, David Lim, said to me, Willie, do you know this floor? And I said, yes. He said, where can we get water? He said, well, on the opposite side, there's a water vending machine. The bottles, the water bottles. And he said, let's go. I said, what? was this type of bottles. He said, let's go. I said, let's go. I said, oh, man. I'm looking in my pocket. I have no change. He said, oh, man. <laughs> yeah, because I was worried. How am I going to buy those things? And when we get there in front of the machine, David Lim starts breaking the glass of the machine with his boot. Pa, pa, pa. And I'm like, <laughs> buddy, you're breaking the law. That's a cop breaking the machine. And I say, I'm the Puerto Rican here. And I'm getting out of here. He's going to blame me. He's going to blame me. Because I was worried. He's going to blame me. But then we start taking trash cans. And we start taking the bottles and putting them on trash cans. And we distribute them to the firemen. We looked here, here, here. We gave it to all of them. And that's when I see inside the office somebody's using a phone. And I said, phone service. Let me call my mother. And you see, I come from the island of Puerto Rico, small island in the Caribbean. Ricky Martin, yeah. Jennifer Lopez. <laughs> ah, you know that one. But I wanted to call my mother to let her know that there was an accident in the building. And uh, what a surprise. She picks up the phone, and she's screaming. What are you? What are you? I say, Mom, I'm in the building. What? Remember, we didn't know that the whole world was watching this. And she's screaming, get out. Get out now. Get out, out of the building. And I said, Mom, I'm OK. I'm complete. Nothing is missing. Nothing is missing, and I'm helping these people because they don't know what they're doing. And I have the master key. And she's like, get out, don't go to the fire, don't go to the fire. And ladies and gentlemen, I lied to my mother because I said, don't worry, mom, I'm not going to the fire. I will get to certain area and I will leave. And honestly, I lied to her because if it was up to me, I would have gone through the fire to get to my friends. And you know, it's sad because I've been recognized for saving so many lives, but in reality, I never saved a single one of my friends. I never made it to the top.
And this is sad. Stays with you because you suffer something called survivor's guilt. What did I survive and they didn't? Why are you here and they're not? And it's not, not easy. It stays with you like an imprint for the rest of your life. I hang up the phone and I'm getting calls on the radio by the supervisor of the building. Willie Rodriguez, location. I'm on the 27th floor. I'm with a fireman. I'm, I'm helping them. Abandon the building, abandon the building. And I'm like, I can't. You know, I'm helping these people. As a matter of fact, you can get the actual transcripts, the actual transcripts from the fire department website, and you can hear the conversation. So I shut off the radio because I didn't want to be bothered by him either. And I continue by myself up the stairwells, still opening doors and letting people out. Up to the moment that I get to the 33rd floor, and the reason that I went to the 33rd floor, it was empty at that moment because I went around the corridor and there's nobody. And when I go to the corner, what do I find? A lady, a blonde lady, no shoes, on the floor, holding herself. And I said, what are you doing here? Get out, get out, get out. And she said, I'm a new employee here. I don't know where to go. Ladies and gentlemen, the World Trade Center had fire drills only twice a year. With 50,000 workers in that building, it was immoral that they didn't have mandatory training for people to know before they went to work there where the exits were and what to do in a case of emergency. They did not know, right? This lady didn't know. Thanks to Sally Regenhardt and the Skycraper Safety uh, 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 um, Organization, this was changed because now every building must have that, that is built from now on. But here you have prevention was not the best part. I picked it up. I said, you got to get out now. You got to get out now. Picked it up, brought it to the door of the stairwell. I said, get out. And two guys were coming down from the 43rd floor cafeteria. They had these white clothes on it. And I knew them. I said, guys, please give me a hand. Get it out. Please, I beg you, please. And they said, don't worry, Willie, we'll help you. Don't worry, we'll, we'll bring it down. And they start helping this lady down. Then I went back to the 33rd floor, and you see the 33rd floor was a very important floor for me because it's where I had my office. Okay, it was a closet. <laughs> but you know you call it your office. Oh, meet me at the office, meet me at the office. But that's where I have all my cleaning supplies for the building. And I wanted to get there to get a box of those masks to give it to the people, distribute to the people. And when I go there, I hear something very strange. On the 34th floor, the floor above me, I hear this strange noise going boom, scratching the floor. It sounded like a big, how you call this, uh, metal dumpster with the steel wheels scratching the floor and it sounded very heavy, and I got totally scared. You know why? Because I knew that that was an empty floor. There was nobody there. It was scraped out. You know, the construction will go there when a tenant moves out and they scrape all the walls, they take all the sheetrock. You know what I'm talking about. They take everything out. And how did I know this? Well, I'll tell you a secret. I used to hide there for lunch because <laughs> I didn't want to be found by the supervisor. And yes, sometimes I took more than half an hour lunch. <laughs> and yes, sometimes I slept there. And no, I never did anything kinky there. <laughs> so I knew it was an empty floor. And you know, it's funny because people have come out and said, no, there was construction there. They tried to debunk this. But the funny thing is that that same information is the one that was going on the 34th floor, that construction was going on the 34th floor of the South Tower, not the North Tower. Anyway, I didn't open that door because I was scared. That was the only door that I did not open. What was there? What was going on there? Some people say it may have been the firemen working there. 
above me, maybe another unit. Could have been, I don't know, I never opened the door. But that noise was too strong. And I continue up to the 39th floor opening doors. When I get to the 39th floor, I open the door, I'm on the corridor, from the opposite door of the stairwells, David Lim comes up with two firemen. And we're talking about what was gonna be the next process of rescue. When we hear, boom! Very strong explosion, very, very powerful. The building shake. And at that moment, what I think afterwards, you know, trying to put the, the whole thing together, that that was the impact of the plane on the other tower. Not that it was, not that it was, but that's what I thought afterwards. And when I hear that, automatically we lost our footing, and on our building we hear, pa, 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 and a collapse, boom. And on the radio we hear, we lost 65, we lost 65. Meaning the 65th floor went down floor by floor by floor, all the way down to the sky lobby, which was the 44th floor. And I'm on the 39th floor, five flights away. And I start screaming, we gotta go up, we gotta go up. And David Lim said, Willie, we, you've done enough, but you don't get paid for this. Get out. I said, I'm going up, man, I'm going up. He said, Willie, you're still a civilian, you're my responsibility, get out. He said, David, I don't care, I'm going up, man. He said, Willie, you cannot go up there. Get out. Better if you give me a hand with the person on the wheelchair on the 27th floor and get out. The person on the wheelchair was named Ed Bayet. And he was already placed on a rescue basket. You know those rescue baskets that they use on the helicopters? One of those. And he was tied up. And I said, David, I will help you. I will go down. I will help you with this guy. But I'm coming right back because I am not giving the key to anybody because I don't want to get fired. <laughs> Honestly, because they told me that if I ever lost this key, I would be automatically fired, and I have to pay for the replacement of every lock. <laughs> and that was expensive locks over there. I will still be paying for it. So I said, I'm not giving this. I was holding this key to dear life. So I ran down, went to the 27th floor, said, I got orders to get this man out right now. And those heroes, those firemen, as tired as they were, think about this. One of them stood up and said, okay, buddy, we'll help you, let's go. As tired as they were, those heroes. I said, come on, guys. And we pick up Mr. Ed Bellier, and we started going down the stairwell. As we go down, we take our steps, we take a little break, but we continue going down. And then I realized that I heard something that I didn't realize before. I heard the screams of the people screaming for help inside the passenger elevators. And that's something that you never hear about on any of the statements. You never hear about this. And my biggest regret was that I didn't have the training or didn't have the tools to help these people. And as we go down, you know, that World Trade Center, these stairwells should have been encased in concrete, the stairwell because it's a fire escape area. This is all shit rock. You could see offices through the walls. Stupid. As we go down, we hear boom, what I think is the collapse of the South Tower. Remember, I have no windows. And it was so powerful, again, that the building oscillated, but the fluorescent light inside the towers on the stairwell the long ones, they started to break at unison because they shifted position. The holders, they started clash, 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 and all the windows blowing up, basically. And when I hear that, I didn't know what it was. I mean, we lost our footing. The guy on the wheelchair, Mr. Ed Bellier, he's like in horror. And I said, don't worry, after this, we're gonna get a beer. And we're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we don't, I mean, I don't even drink. It's just, just something that you say in the process to help people. Mr. Ebeye was having difficult time breathing, very difficult time. Nice guy for what I was able to gather in those minutes that I spent with him. And as we go down, we make it to the lobby. When I open the door, oh no, the door was open, I'm sorry. When I get to the lobby and I look right in the center, all that beautiful marble that was on the World Trade Center lobby is pulled from the walls. There's no marble there. The only thing you saw was the cement patches where the marble used to be. And then 
the doors of the elevators were open from the bottom up like this. Indication that something powerful came up. Think about that. Open like this. Why they didn't open like that? And when I saw that, I was like, what is this? This is dust, this gray dust, everybody, uh, on top of everybody and everywhere. And one of the firemen said, get the ambulance ready, get the ambulance ready. I looked to the left, and the whole shopping center and mezzanine is collapsed. So I start going to the front of the building, the main entrance, that faced West Street. And as I go to the front, and I get closer to what it was, the revolving doors, there was no revolving doors left. The only thing you saw was the frame. Every glass that was there was broken into pieces. As I get there, and I get in the middle of that center frame, I look and across the street, a block and a half away, what they call World Financial Center. The police have the area cordoned out so nobody will go in. When they see me there, they start screaming, don't look back, don't look back, don't look back. And when they tell you don't look back, what do you do? You look back. Human condition. Human condition. So I turn around and say, well, don't look back. And when I turn around, ladies and gentlemen, I saw the most horrible thing I've seen in my life. I saw all the bodies of the people that jumped out of the building. There were bodies everywhere, and you could not recognize them because the impact was so powerful that the only thing you saw was skin, skin mask, and clothing, nothing else. And it was so horrible, and I started crying. I said, God, what is this, God, what is this? And when I lowered my face again, and this is the worst part of my presentation, when I lowered my face, the only body that I recognized was that lady from the 33rd floor that I helped escape. I found her cut in half. And it was like a glass came from the top of the building, and that's my speculation. And like a guillotine with the force, basically like a guillotine cut it in half. And when I saw that, I started crying, God, what's this? God, please, what's this? Because this was horror song. I saw more death in a couple of seconds than a soldier would see sometimes in an act of war. And when I saw that, I started crying. And all of a sudden, like an earthquake, everything started to rumble. And all of a sudden, I hear, run, run, run. And the police is running across the street. And I have nowhere to run. Because remember, if you took the World Trade Center and put it sideways, it went almost to Chinatown. Because it was a city within a city, 110 floors. And I said, this is going to kill me. This is going to kill me. And the only thing I saw, a distance from here to the wall, was a fire truck parked in front of the building. So I started running towards the fire truck. I slipped right under, and the building started to collapse right on top of me. Pa, 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 and the truck going down. And the only thing I said at that moment was, God, please don't give my mother the pain of seeing my body in pieces. I beg you, please, because I didn't want my mother to see what I just saw. Bodies that were unrecognizable. And I was crying. And all of a sudden, silence. And then this dust, remember this cloud of dust when the tower collapsed? This dust came under every orifice. And it burned my face, my skin. And I put my face under my, my shirt. And I started lowering my breathing. You see, I was a magician for 30 years, and I was trained by the amazing Randy on escape acts, how to escape from uh, straight jackets. From, and the first thing that they teach you is that you have to lower your breathing in trouble, relax, and wait for help. I was waiting for death. And I'm trapped there, and I didn't know what to do. Luckily, from across the street, two television stations pinpointed the area. They said the last man out was in that area. And that's how they started looking under the rubble. Once they pulled me from the rubble, hours after, four hours after, something like that, I get pulled. I think that I lost my legs because I cannot move my legs. But it was the illusion of going so many times up and down the stairwells that my knee gave up. My knee, my right knee was open from side to side and bleeding. But ladies and gentlemen, I did not break a single bone. It was a miracle. 
did not break a single bone. God gave me a unique and second opportunity in life at that moment, especially for a person that was agnostic. <laughs> so at that moment, when I get oxygen for 50 minutes on the epicenter of ground zero, I start running back to the area to find a fire truck, the fire truck. And you see, once I get pulled from the rubble and I look at the fire truck, the tires have been blown off five minutes after. So I was safe at the nick of time because if they expected five minutes more, I would be crushed to death. Crushed to death. And I'm telling you, it's a miracle that I'm here. So when I went to the news, thank you. I went to the news and uh, all the sudden, CNN is calling me, they're always, oh, come, come, come here. I go over there, I say, maybe somebody will see me and let my mother know that I'm alive. <laughs> so they go like this, you have 30 seconds to go on the air, we're going live now, tell your story now. And I'm like, ah, la, 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 la. <laughs> and I'm talking, there was a rumble, a big rumble, and there was an elevator, there was fire, there was this. I didn't even know what I said, remember, I just got pulled from the rubble. Just pulled from the rubble. And of course, they always use that, but they don't use the information that we have that later on that day, I went on the news and I gave a detailed account and it was televised everywhere. And uh, wow. apparently that disappeared, but we got news. We got two interns working at CNN that found the original tape and we are going to make it available. Very good. Very good. So. Within three days, my story was being constantly edited, changed, you know. It was a great story, think about it. Yeah, janitor not training, uh, help save hundreds of people, great, wonderful, but take everything about the explosion, take everything about the victims. Nobody actually believed this. Until, after I become an activist, Felipe David wakes up 13 weeks after from coma, sees me on television in Spanish, Calls the doctor and says, that's the guy that saved me. Wow. And they do the connection and uh, NBC makes the encounter. And we do the encounter and I meet for the first time Mr. Felipe David and his story exactly the same as I told you right now. And the sad thing is that Felipe was never called to testify by the 9-11 Commission. He had to go to Peru this is in Peru, to tell his story. It was seen by 102 million people in Spanish. You never heard of them. You never heard of them. Then on top of that, that happens. This guy is reunited with me, survives also, burned on the back. This is actual video, but uh, it's not working. And he talks about this explosion on the basement and how he was burned. Then you have David Lim. He was the Port Authority police officer. That I went on the news saying that he died. What? I said he died because I left him in the building. And I went on national television and I almost killed his family. Oh my God. Yes. But he was the cop that was under the rubble that took his gun and started shooting so people would find him. Oh my God. So he survived. And this is the encounter for, again, NBC Spanish version Telemundo. Telemundo is owned by NBC, who is NBC is owned by General Electric, military industrial complex. So it goes again to millions upon millions of people in Spanish, but you never saw the encounter on television in English. And he talks about our experience. And then Salvatore Giambanco, remember Salvatore Giambanco was the painter that was ready to be drowned on the basement. He sees the encounters on television, calls ABC News and the Christian Television Network. They do the encounter on Ground Zero. Never met the guy before and his story exactly the same as I told you right now and I never met him before. He talks about everything that happened. Of course, he was never called to testify for the 9-11 Commission either. 
because we owe the truth to the victims, survivors, and those affected by 9-11. And those affected is you. You are affected by the event. We're still searching for answers. We don't want our tragedy to be used as an international political agenda that we do not agree with. And in conclusion. Now, in conclusion, you have to realize that we're losing our rights constantly yep. with the excuse of making us more secure. You have to realize that we don't have the activism that we used to have on the 60s. Being around the world, they call us the MTV couch potatoes activist. That's what they call us. They say, you're the one sitting there on the couch saying, I don't like this, I don't like that, but we don't make a change. Take it upon yourself to make changes for the better. Take it upon yourself to ask questions and not to be sold something that we are still, after 9-11, still requesting to be exposed. We want a reinvestigation. We want all the documents to be available, not on the Secrets Act. We want everything to be open, and it is not. I don't do this, and I've been accused of doing this for attention. I don't need to do this. I'm already part of history. I am living history. I experienced it, and I went through it for the last six years. I don't like to do this. Do you understand the burden that is on my back every day to relieve 9-11 and to talk about it nonstop, but because God gave me that second opportunity, I have to glorify that second opportunity and be the voice for those victims that don't have answers. <laughs> Do you remember that movie? Do you remember that movie, uh, Ghost, with Patrick Swayze? Yeah. Sam, that he couldn't go to rest until they found the people that killed him? Well, I feel the same thing with those angels behind my back still searching and I tell you for me it's a mission I do this not for money because I could have taken millions of dollars for campaign financing I could have taken millions of dollars from Hollywood I have take I could have taken money to do a book or many books that I was offered money left and right and there was money to be made as major Giuliani and Giuliani Partners, they made $107 million in the last six years. Look for it. And here I am, and if you didn't know this, two years ago, after raising millions of dollars for the community, after putting programs for the victims constantly, after getting an amnesty, I found myself homeless, living under a bridge. That was two years ago. And nobody helped me. All right? Because those non for profit organizations said, mm. and I raised millions of dollars. So we didn't do this for money. You can go into my website, william911.com, william911.com, and you can see the actual television PSA, public service announcement, me asking for help for the victims. So I raised millions of dollars for those organizations, and I was left hanging was an organization, a church came out and gave me a hand. So, definitely no for money. We survive on donations, that's how we go around the world. People ask, who pays for your trips everywhere? Say, grassroots, people like you. This is the same suit I have in the last five years. So don't get fooled by this. It's the same suit that you have seen on all those pictures. Yeah. You think I should have bought one by now, a new one? Yeah, right. So we survive on your donations as well. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, take it up with yourself to make a change. If you cannot make a change, then support those people 
that are making the change for you. I'm putting their skins out there for you. Because right now, I could be deemed an enemy combatant because I'm against the war in Iraq. And as you know, the president signed a directive now, or an amendment to the many directives that he wrote before, that makes it illegal for anybody that interrupt the Iraq process. In other words, anybody that is an activist against the war in Iraq. So, you know, I could be stopped tomorrow very easily. So take it upon yourself to make a change. And number one, God bless you for being here. And number two, thank you for your time because I know it's been valuable. God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.